All right, good morning, everybody. It's uh, it's 9 o'clock. And I'm looking at my list here. It looks like we have. Everybody on the council. Um, thanks for being here this morning and we have a much lighter agenda uh, than we did yesterday. And I want to. Before we start, I just want to say thanks to those of you who reached out. Um, to me yesterday, I. I've been I've been sick and I was just having a really difficult time yesterday trying to manage everything. So um, I hope that today is going to be a little lighter on the, uh, you know, as far as what we have to get uh, take care of and get done. But thanks for those of you who reached out. Just I want you to know that I'm I'm fine. Um, I'm just I'm fighting with uh, a number of different health uh, issues, but. It's all good. I should be good to go. Um, so, but thanks for thanks for thinking about me and caring about me. Um, yesterday was a long day, and I want to thank you for your patience uh, in getting through that. And we have our agenda for this morning. We're going to start with the business session, and um, we're going to start with committee reports. And uh, Paul Rago, Dr. Paul Rago, is here uh, to provide the SSC report. So, Paul. If you're ready to go, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I hope I don't uh, add to your distress at all uh, today or further compound any any problems, but uh, um, the SSC did not meet, so I have no formal report. I just wanted to uh, draw your attention to um, the ongoing work of the ecosystem uh, work group, um, which is you know focused on operationalizing, if you will, uh, the information from the uh, state of the ecosystem report. And so that it's got a lot of energy and we're, we're looking forward to uh, providing um, information. So stay tuned over the course of the year. Um, the economic work group has been very busy over the past year and uh, some of that will culminate in meetings next week um, with respect to uh, research set aside program and input that uh, we hope has been helpful um, in that regard. And so that has been uh, coordinated with the research steering committee. Um, <clears throat> finally, we're, we're also preparing for um, uh, a response on the harvest control rule, which uh, you uh, right. recommended yesterday. So we're-, we're Yeah, don't we're, remind me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah sorry. right. Hopefully, right. hopefully that isn't a source of distress or too much additional distress to you. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, this, we're sort of in the preseason uh, training uh, camp here uh, for the, the 2022 assessment season that kind of starts uh, in March. And, uh, you know, we, uh, Brandon uh, has been, uh, you know, masterful in terms of coordinating uh, all the moving, moving parts and look forward to working with him over the course of the year. So uh, that concludes my report and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, let me see if anybody has any questions. Yeah, I think the harvest control rule is the last of my worries this morning. My daughter got in a car accident this morning. And so that that's what I've been deal, dealing with oh, since oh. Uh, 630. She's, everyone's fine. Everyone's okay. But uh, yeah, it's the, uh, the last thing on my mind, but no, I appreciate your report. Um, let me ask if anyone has any questions. All right, I'm not seeing any hands. Is there anyone from the public that would like to ask uh, Paul any questions about the upcoming plans for the SSC? Okay. I don't see anyone at this point. Um, Paul, thanks for your report. And uh, yeah, we'll look forward to uh, working with you guys, um, you know, on the HCR stuff uh, in the coming months, but thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Okay. So next, our next report is the um, Research uh, Steering Committee. We have Dr. Michelle Duvall, who chairs that committee to provide us a report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I 
promise not to make any motions today, and hopefully this will be brief. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Michelle. I appreciate that. Um, so I just, you know, there's a there's a committee report in your briefing material. So I'm just going to hit the highlights here. Um, you know, knowing we have a lot on our agenda, so. I just want to highlight that committee leadership and staff and the SSC's economic work group worked pretty hard between November, uh, our November meeting and January meeting to develop sort of a decision tree to identify key decisions that would shape any potential redevelopment of an RSA program. And um, the SSC's economic work group, you know, in preparation for our January meeting, developed a memo illustrating how you know, prioritization of the draft goals that the committee had developed would inform the process of walking through that decision tree and, you know, allow the committee to evaluate and understand the trade offs of a particular decision and and how, you know, a set of decisions could impact achieving other goals since so many of those um, those are linked. So at our January meeting, we reviewed, uh, refined and prioritized the draft goals that we developed in November and that prioritization informed how we developed a set of draft decisions for these top tier decision points. And so those draft decisions um, have informed the development of our agenda for our final workshop next week, um, where we'll go ahead and review the feedback from the first three workshops that we had. And then, you know, with with members of the SSC's economic work group, we're going to walk through those draft decisions, um, you know, gather additional information from or feedback from panelists and the public. And then the committee is going to meet near the end of April, um, hopefully in person to review all the information that we've gathered throughout this process um, and put together final recommendations for the council regarding um, you know, whether we recommend redevelopment of the S of the RSA program and if so, what that should look like. So, you know, I just want to thank all of the committee members for their hard work, um, the SSC's economic work group for, you know, providing feedback and, and guidance, uh, you know, to help the committee navigate this issue and consider all aspects over the past year or so. Um, Want to thank staff and our facilitator, Andy Loftus, for their hard work and support of, you know, Adam and I to, you know, complete this task and really get it across the finish line for the council's consideration in June. So with that, Mr. Chairman, um, I'm done and I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, any questions for Michelle? So the ongoing the, the plan right now, Michelle, is to have that final final meeting in in uh, in June. So we have our final workshop next week on yeah, February. This is workshop and is that I can't I'm, I know we talked about this, but is that the is that virtual or is that the one in Baltimore? So that's the one that was supposed to be in person in Baltimore, but we just felt it was prudent to go ahead and move that to a virtual platform, and we've been. We've been really fortunate with the level of participation that we've received from, you know, all the panelists. So we we felt comfortable doing that. And we just didn't want to delay that final workshop um, anymore. You know, just being concerned about sort of collateral impacts on other council priorities. So we yeah, sure. decided instead to try to have um, an in-person committee meeting to work through all these final recommendations near the end of April. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, let me see if anybody from the council has any questions for uh, Michelle. All right, I don't see any hands at this time. Um, but um, yeah, Michelle, thank you for your report and uh, appreciate all the work that the members of the committee have been doing. And um, I'm going to do my best to try to participate in that. On that um, on that call next week, so thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to the executive director's report. We have uh, Dr. Chris Moore. Chris, are you ready to go on your report? Ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, okay. everyone. Uh, I want to, uh, if everyone could turn to the material behind tab six. There's a number of items behind that tab that I'd like to discuss with the council this morning. 
there's the list uh, one through nine of the topics that we are going to touch on. And then there's four other topics that are four other four other things that are attached as supplemental comments or supplemental materials to uh, the executive director's report that we'll talk about as well. Um, if you so Chris, if, yes. before you get before you get into it, do you want to do you want to take one piece at a time and get questions, comments, or do you want to go through everything? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to break it up so that uh, you're going to break it up. Okay, that's that's fine. We do, yeah, we do have we do have some expected council action on some of the topics. So I'll stop. Uh, see if there's questions, comments, and then we'll and then we'll go from there. Okay. Sounds good. Yep. Thanks. So uh, the first uh, item behind the tab is our 2022 planned council meeting topics. Uh, this is the culmination of a process that began in October, uh, last October when we presented to the executive committee what we thought we should do in 2022 as it related to our implementation plan that was carried forward into our December meeting where the council considered uh, the comments from the executive committee and considered some additional things and uh, ended up with our 2022 uh, implementation plan. Um, so we basically as staff take that implementation plan and then uh, see how uh, we can arrange everything over the year to make sure that all that gets done. And I think folks that have been associated with the council for a while understand that a large part of our schedule over the years is driven by specs. So we you see a lot of <laughs> specifications, either setting specifications or reviewing specifications. Um, but uh, there's also other items here, again, of interest to the council and the ones that uh, we approved in December. If uh, you look at this, uh, this document in detail, uh, you see that we're scheduled to have our next council meeting in Galloway, New Jersey, April 5th through 7th. If you look at the items under that uh, header, you see that there'll be a lot of discussion related to tilefish, both gold and blue line, public uh, specifications. We'll be talking about our macro rebuild, Chad, climate change stereo planning, um, assessment update. A lot of things there that suggest to me that we'll have two and a half full days of uh, council meeting. So looking at the schedule now and, and knowing that sometimes things change, it's likely that we'll start uh, Tuesday morning and go through uh, Thursday afternoon for that particular meeting. Meetings followed by our council meeting in Riverhead in June, busy meeting. Um, Here's, uh, as we talked about yesterday, this is the meeting that we plan to uh, deal with the recreational harvest control rule. Uh, we'll be meeting jointly with the policy board again. We'll also be talking about Chubb Mackerel, Julia's favorite species, and certainly uh, one that she's very excited about talking about in June. Uh, we'll have the Mackerel Rebuilding Amendment. We'll be talking about long fin squid. We actually also have um, this thing that we've kind of kicked around for a while, the aqu aquaculture policy that uh, we want to review and have the council approve. Um, we, as Bill indicated, uh, we'll be talking about the research set-aside program redevelopment in uh, June and some other things as well. If you look at the schedule for the rest of the year, uh, most of the meetings are very busy. Our August meeting is another joint meeting. This one with the SMSC board, also the Bluefish board. Uh, we'll talk about some, uh, some things related to uh, specifications. Uh, we have the EAFM management strategy evaluation that uh, Brandon's been working on with C. Uh, we also plan to have an evaluation of scup discards in the gear restricted areas. That's something that we haven't done for a couple of years, largely because of the lack of information. So remember that uh, we had very discard data for scup in, I think it was 20. Better, but certainly um, we need the time to together to provide for the evaluation. Um, one of the other things that uh, we'll be talking about is this recreational sector separation amendment that's on our list. That's something that we haven't forgotten about. Uh, folks are very interested in how that's going to uh, proceed. That uh, <laughs> so that's August. So again, a busy meeting. I expect uh, that will be a full three days, uh, perhaps. And again, I'll be joint with. Uh, um, October, a little lighter meeting, at least at this point. I expect that that's going to change. That meeting scheduled for Dewey Beach. And then December, we have uh, a meeting in our favorite places, Annapolis, Maryland, uh, where again, we'll meet with 
to our jointly uh, managed species. If you look at uh, the next document, this gives you another look at how these topics lay out over the year. Um, we're easy to read. Hey, hey Chris, yes. sorry to interrupt you. Your audio is kind of coming in and out a little bit. I don't know if you can get a little closer to the mic. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Mary. I was. I was just. I was. You did. I was going to say the same thing. You're, you're just breaking up a little bit, Chris. Folks know that I come from a long line of mumblers. <laughs> oh, so anyway, I apologize for that. So hopefully you can hear me better now. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. You just every, every once in a while it just cuts out. Okay. So uh, hopefully you heard most of the important things about the uh, schedule for 2022. Bottom line, very busy. Most of the meetings, very busy. Uh, April meeting, expect uh, two and a half uh, full days. Hopefully, I should have said this. Hopefully, uh, it's uh, it's going to be uh, a hybrid meeting. We're expecting a hybrid meeting given where we're at with COVID. So we'll run the meeting exactly like we ran the one in December and offer uh, folks the opportunity to either attend in person or uh, virtually. <laughs> Hopefully, that's all going to work out. Uh, the next item is the uh, council meeting topics at a glance. Again, just a different way of looking at uh, the. At it, and I'll stop at this point before I get on to the next topic and see if there's any questions or comments. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, any questions for Chris to this point? Adam Nawalski. Thanks very much. So for the proposed uh, review of the outcomes of the RSA workshop, uh, the committee has worked with a number of other groups, uh, including making sure we had involvement from states and the ASMFC as part of things. Uh, with that scheduled for decision making in June, it appears, uh, how will that afford the opportunity for some of these other joint stakeholders where we do joint management that would affect to provide input and or participate in that decision making? Thank you, uh, thank you Adam, for the question. Um, I think one of the things that I, I think everyone knows is that we're very adaptable as it comes to our schedule. Right, and for things that aren't um, related to specs, we tend to move things around a little bit over the. Put that uh, RSA um, issue in the in the uh, June box. We assume that in fact we'd be ready to take on that particular task in June. However, if in fact we have to wait, we'll wait. Right, if it's or even October, and certainly that's something that we can talk about. Um, and we'll make that decision based on, you know, the information that I get from you and Michelle and, and certainly staff as well. Does that help? Yeah, did you want, I think did you want to follow that, up at him? Yeah, yeah go I ahead. think given that I appreciate the answer, uh, a little slow with the unmute here this morning, apologies for delaying things. Uh, yeah, I think we would want to consider in particular, uh, you know, the summer flounder scup and black sea bass board, making sure that we've got a way to include them, given that uh, those would be the joint management plans that could be significantly affected if we start taking quota um, away from either rec commercial directly and redirecting it to RSA. So. Appreciate that consideration and look forward to uh, leadership working with those organizations to make sure those decisions can be considered jointly, if possible. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, Chris, I have Bob Beal with a question, perhaps, or maybe a comment. Go ahead, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, just a quick question or, or a request, I guess. Chris, I think you mentioned the April meeting would be a hybrid meeting. Um, I was wondering, you know, maybe if we could think about the June meeting also being a hybrid meeting, you may be heading that way anyway. I'm just, you know, if it is a joint meeting with the policy board, getting to Riverhead's not the easiest place to get for some of our commissioners, which, you know, for what might be a 
I don't know, three or four hour meeting. Uh, so if that one would have a hybrid option, that might be really helpful for uh, logistics as well. Uh, yeah, so Bob um, and Chris, Chris can, can speak to this too, but, you know, Chris and I just, uh, we've talked about the meetings. I think for the, for the rest of this calendar year, Chris, and correct me if I'm wrong, but we've decided that we would have, you know, we would do the hybrid meeting um, for the rest of this calendar year and then rethink uh, 2023 uh, as far as, in, you know, mandatory in person or not. Um, that's that's where we're going, right, Chris? Yeah, correct. So, uh, you know, we've discussed, you know, how 2022 is going to lay out or how it's going to happen. And um, you just said this earlier, all the meetings in 2022 are going to be hybrid based on the conversations that we've had leadership and June will be just like April. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, Bob, does that cover your question? Yeah, that's a huge help. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, yeah. We're here. We're here to please. Okay, I don't see any other hands at this time. Um, go ahead. If you want to uh, continue through your presentation, Chris, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. The next item behind the tab. These tables we didn't include in the last um, briefing book under the executive director's tab because I thought folks were getting tired of looking at them. But then I realized that there's some information in here that we really do need to talk about because we've had some questions about what we're doing, like what's going on with the particular documents, so and where we're at with staff and what's Garfo doing with with some of these things. So, so I put this in here just to remind folks uh, of. What we've agreed to do and where we're at with those particular uh, topics. So the first one is status of council actions under development. Uh, we've talked too much about the recreational harvest control rule. I think everyone understands that. The staff lead for that is Julia Beatty. Also have another document that is related to rec reform, which is the uh, technical guidance document. And uh, basically, uh, the status there is once we get through the harvest control rule part of this. Then Julia will pick up uh, this particular guidance documents or next task as it relates to, as it relates to recreational reform. We also have another task related to recreational reform, and that's the recreational sector separation and catch accounting amendment. And this is an action that was actually initiated by the council and the policy board back in October of 2020. Uh, we have made any progress on this document either because of the um, our activities related to the harvest control rule. And we're thinking at, least at this point that the council and board may consider approval of a scoping document for this amendment by the end of uh, 2022. We also have uh, some other um, FMP um, actions underneath uh, that one that includes Circle and Ocean Quoa. We've talked about the separation requirements the last or this amendment separation requirement amendment. We talked about it at our December 21 meeting uh, where white paper um, and uh, we to an amendment for this particular action. We've asked the uh, asked folks for FMAT membership. We got a response to those letters. We have an FMAT team now. We're gonna be moving forward with that action in 2022. Remember in terms of macro rebuilding, uh, we're now titling this macro rebuilding 2.0. Uh, given the action that uh, we took in December, um, and basically the action will reset the Atlantic macro rebuilding and consider related management measures, including the cap that we have in place for River Herring and Chad. Jason is the principal staff lead on that particular um, amendment. This one we're not quite sure about, and certainly um, we need to follow up with Garfo about it because we're thinking about the list, and on our list is this omnibus amendment for data modernization. That we've had on the list for a while. This may have, have morphed into something else. Uh, certainly, um, we are very interested in what the agency is doing relative to fishery dependent data. Um, there is the fishery dependent data initiative that this council has heard about a couple of times. We've taken on actions related to the VVTRs in the last couple of years. All that is detailed in these particular boxes here. But the bottom line is that, in fact, we are still interested. Or the GARFO is still developing this omnibus amendment for data modernization 
uh, we're going to be involved in that. Before I move on, let me stop there uh, and see if there's any questions. Yeah, that's good, Chris. Uh, any questions for Chris? Anyone from the public? All right, Chris, I'm not seeing any hands at this time. So, uh, yeah, you can uh, keep going. Chair, so the next item is a uh, timeline and status of recent actions and amendments under review. So this was uh, updated as of uh, January 25th. And some of these things aren't too recent. And um, serves as a reminder about the process and also uh, allows me to basically point out where we're at with some of the um, issues, amendments uh, that we've been involved with and folks have been asking about, like what happened to the excessive shares amendment, for example. And basically this takes you through our timeline as to where we're at. Uh, we actually had council approval back in December of 2019 um, and submitted the document in April of 2020. And I think folks understand this, but I'll you know, just quickly say this. When we have final council action on a particular thing, amendment framework, there's still work involved. So it's not like once you decide that you know you you, you want to uh, amend something that all council staff work is done. In fact, a lot of the work has to happen after you make that decision. And not only do we get involved in terms of so Garfo staff and center staff. So there's a lot of folks involved once once a council makes a decision. And you see that here in terms of initial initial submission. And then what we have titled as final submission. So between the initial and final, our staff goes back and forth with GARFO staff and maybe uh, center staff to basically perfect uh, the submission documents before they undergo a more thorough review at uh, GARFO and the Science Center. So looking at um, CERC plans, um, the last thing that we did with CERC plans was get involved in deeming. So after the review, the internal review, uh, was together uh, uh, basically uh, deeming what they call deeming regulations that they send to us. Uh, Mike and I look at them with staff to make sure that they say exactly what the council wanted to say, and then they go back to uh, Garfo for eventual. So we're waiting on the proposed regs for um, excessive shares amendment. I'm hoping that uh, those come out soon so we can get those out on the street and have folks uh, take a look at them and then. Um, somewhat similar uh, vein, we have a school mackerel butterfish goals and objectives and LX permit amendment. We had a lot of interest in that particular amendment. We had a lot of folks uh, in council actually approved that document in July of 2020. Um, uh, Jason had some work to do after the approval. There's other things that uh, that had to be done as well. Remember, council staff were involved in a number of items at any given time. And once uh, he got through what he needed to get done, we had submission in uh, March of 21. So that's the last thing that you see on here. And we're basically now in, in the mode of edits to the submission documents. So again, we can get that into the pipeline and get uh, get a proposed rule public. Or that we had the letter from Mike from Garfo indicating that they had serious concerns about uh, the the document, the document being our submission document, the EA, the EA, and questions about what in fact <laughs> is in that document as related to some of the economic concerns that they had and some other points. So Jason's been busy working on those, doing all the other stuff that he's involved with, including the Mackerel rebuilding amendment and specs, spiny dogfish, and all that. So, so we're working on that. And we again, we expect that a proposed rule hopefully will come out in 2022. So we can get that on the street and have folks react to that. The other uh, one that folks have asked me about is the Black Sea Bass Commercial State Allocation Amendment. Remember this? You know, this is a this is something that we took final action on in February of 21. Advised our final action in August of 21 based on a remand from the ASMSC policy board. So we've been kicking this one around for a while as well. And at this point, basically what we're we're in a, uh, a wait mode. Um, a, we have 
to GARFO in November of 21 and uh, to system. And again, hoping for a proposed rule on that particular item in 22. And what you see here too is an interplay between priorities and workload and staffing. And remember that this Black Sea Bass Commercial State Allocation Amendment was approved both by the council and the board. So the allocations that are in the, the uh, commission's um, amendment are the same as the ones that we submitted to uh, GARFO. So those allocations could be implemented even though they haven't been published yet by the, by in the expect that, um, you know, again, this, is become, this will become more of a priority. So um, the other things, uh, just quickly, bluefish allocation rebuilding amendment, we got that through the system relatively quickly um, and had that approved. Um, basically, the regs became effective in July or July, January of 22. Uh, we continue to work on the tilefish multi-year specifications framework. That's another one that uh, we took, uh, had recent approval on back in, um, the allocation amendment we just recently completed. So that one was uh, approved in December and uh, Kylie and others are busy, are busy working on the EA to get that uh, package together for submission to GARFO. And I'll stop there. Well, let me just say this. I think you take a look at the, the next timeline. I don't have any specific comments here related to current or upcoming specifications. Certainly you take a look at that table and see if there's anything in there that uh, uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I'll stop for questions. All right, thanks, Chris. And um, yeah, I'm not sure what's happening with your audio. It's it's cutting out a little bit. I think I think we got the gist of, of what you presented and uh, let me see if, does anyone have any questions for Chris? All right, Chris, I don't see any hands. Anyone from the public? Okay, no hands at this time, Chris. Um, so if you had more for your report, we can uh, we can continue. I do, Mr. Chair, and I'm disappointed that um, my brand new super duper mic's not working well. So uh, I'll try to speak up. Yeah, you know, we hear you fine. It, it, every once in a while, it just cuts out for five seconds. You know, huh. but, uh, that's interesting. Yeah, I don't know what the yeah. I don't know what the issue is. Okay. Oh, Jason just texted me. It's not a mic issue. So it could be, it could be issues. Other folks are having problems with their audio. I don't know. Anyway, we'll uh, we'll see what. Uh, We'll persevere yeah. and make, make sure yeah. everything works as best as we can. Um, sure. Chris, yeah. do you want to just pause for a second and you could call in on your phone instead of instead of using your mic? Uh, no. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks anyway. <laughs> so yeah, it, we're 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 catching the gist of we're we're catching the meat of what you're what you're saying, Chris. So yeah. yeah again, I'm uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, Jason indicated it's not a mic issue, so I'm not sure it could be a Chris issue. So I'll talk up. Um, Next item beyond the tab is an important uh, document for the council to uh, consider if they haven't yet. Um, this is a memo to the council from Brandon regarding SSC membership reappointments. Uh, remember that uh, members, SSC members serve for three year terms and they're subject to reappointment at the discretion of the council. There are 16 members whose three-year terms expire in March, this March, next month, and therefore are up for reappointment. All 16 of those members are listed in uh, that, uh, that memo below. And all 16 have indicated interest in remaining on the SSC for another uh, three-year term. If folks don't know these SSC members, um, and you can look at our directory. There's short bios there. Certainly, that could help uh, remind you who they are. The other thing that folks ask about or uh, have in the past is meeting attendance. So you can take a look at the, uh, the document that's behind uh, the memo, indicating uh, the percent of meetings attended by uh, these folks, and they all have been regular attendees. 
So with that, Mr. Chair, I would just uh, I would like to stop. Uh, I would indicate to the council that staff supports the reappointment of all of these folks. And um, basically, we need a motion. We need a motion at this point from the council indicating the same or something different. If in fact, folks think it differently. Okay. So, um, all right. So, yeah. Thanks, Chris. Has so was there a motion prepared? I don't have one. I don't know if you don't have one. Okay. Together, but it's, it should be a straightforward motion if someone wants to make one. Yeah. Is there anyone from the council that would like to make a motion at this point? Uh, I see Kate Wilkie. Go ahead, Kate. Me? A minute. Okay. Do you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I move to reappoint the list of SSC members um, as presented today as, maybe? yeah as presented today um, and do I do I need to put a term in there is it is it a year term or is it a... it's a three year um, term but you don't, yes. you don't it, that's okay. implied, that's implied Kate. It's a, okay. I moved to reappoint the list of SSC members as presented today. Yeah. Um, that looks good unless it's missing anything. Yeah, no, I appreciate that Kate. Um, I think that's what, that's what we've done in the past and, and it's, um, it's a simple approach. So do I have a 2nd, is that Michelle Duvall? Are you seconding? That? Yes, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, is there any objection to the motion? Okay, so Kate, your hand is still up, and I'm assuming that you're not objecting. No, no, I'm not yeah. objecting. Too many screens. No, Here's it's okay. I, I understand. I believe me. Um, Okay, so there, I see no objection. So the motion carries with no objection. Is there, are there any abstentions? Okay, seeing none, motion carries by consent. Thank you. Um, so, Chris, I'll come back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Council, for that. Uh, moving on uh, behind the tab, the next item behind the tab relates to. The proposal for the Hudson Canyon National Marine Sanctuary. Um, folks may remember that we actually dealt with this issue back in 2017. I asked uh, Kylie to put together a memo basically detailing the specifics. Greg Domenico had requested that we talk about it at this meeting, given the Federal Register notice that came out uh, in late January. Uh, if you look at the details in Kylie's memo, she basically lays it out uh, very directly in terms of how this stuff works. Uh, in 2014, NOAA established a nomination process. Uh, the nominations are reviewed against a set of uh, criteria and management considerations. Um, and designation is a separate process. Um, on January 21, as I indicated, NOAA published a notice in the register seeking comments. On its five year review of the nomination for the Hudson Canyon National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, the area was added to the inventory on February 23, 2017. Uh, no action has been taken since then. In April of 2017, uh, following that addition of the Hudson Canyon to the inventory, the Mid Atlantic Council wrote a letter expressing concerns about the designation and requesting that the nomination not move forward. And you can see the details of that letter there. I can pull up the, the letter if you want as well. We, uh, one of the specific things that we noted in the letter was that the Hudson Canyon included a part of the Frank R. Lottenberg Deep Sea Coral Protected Area. And those, uh, that area, uh, the boundaries of that area are carefully developed using a cooperative and transparent process. Um, the bottom line is in that last paragraph, the recent Federal Register notice requesting comments on a five year review specifies that the comment should focus solely on any new and relevant information relating to NOAA's 11 
sanctuary domination evaluation criteria that may influence their decision. After reviewing the criteria, we don't believe there's any relevant new information that we could provide relative to the council's previous uh, letter and points. Uh, if NOAA does decide to move forward with the designation process for Hudson Canyon, uh, the council will then have several opportunities for involvement and comments during scoping, as well as a review of the draft management plan and draft EIS. I'll stop there, uh, Mr. Chair, and see if there's any questions or comments about that. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, okay, so I'm just I'm trying to wrap my head around whether or not we need do we need action here? Unless the council wants to you know do something, there's nothing really. We're as uh, Kylie indicates in her memo to us, there's basically nothing to do at this point based on our okay. of where we're at. However, okay. however, if things change, if Noah does decide to take the next step with the canyon, then we should. Definitely step in with comments. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the the comment, it'll it it's it's not for it. We can we can hold off on that and do it do it another time. Exactly. Um, okay. Nothing nothing we need to do today. Nothing, nothing today. Okay. Yeah. But again, if there's, a, sure if there's folks. Clear. Yeah. If there's folks sitting uh, you know sitting around a virtual table that have concern about this or interest in this, we can talk about it today. Yeah, okay. Um, let's see if anyone has any questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Dewey Hemelwright, go ahead, Dewey. Yeah, wouldn't our statement of record uh, in 2017 still be uh, intact today? So, so that would be our stance till something changed, correct? I would say yes, um, but I can ask Chris. Yeah, yeah, I said correct. So yeah, Dewey's correct. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you. All right, thanks, Dewey. Anyone else on this subject? Anyone from the public? Uh, okay, I have. Greg DiDomenico, go ahead, Greg. Good morning, can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? Yep, I got you. It's Greg DiDomenico, Lunds Fisheries. Just wanted to thank you for putting this on the agenda in short notice. I appreciate the update and the conversation about it. I did want to add a few things. Um, I looked in the public record on this topic and could not find the Mid-Atlantic Council letter. So it may not be a bad idea to either resubmit or make sure that it is added to the public record. Uh, I also wanted to speak just briefly to the issue of um, new information. Um, I've not been able to do a proper GIS uh, map or chart of all the areas that we're talking about, but the most recent uh, mud hole slash Hudson Canyon wind lease uh, actually overlaps the uh, original uh, boundaries, uh, the proposed boundaries for the sanctuary. Um, and if you remember, the um, proposed boundaries for the sanctuary actually hit the margins of the gear restricted areas, both north and south. So um, it's just important to realize that 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 lease uh, information is new information. And I and I honestly will tell you, I never I never thought that we would run out of places to fish, but um, it's growing increasingly um, obvious to me that um, between this issue and 30 by 30, um, we're going to have some real, real critical issues with um, just quite frankly running out of places to fish between time and area closures and new designations and windmills and everything else. So. Just wanted to add those few comments and again, thank you for uh, bringing this up today. Appreciate the consideration. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Um, yeah, thanks for bringing that up uh, to my attention and to Chris's attention. Let's see, Mike Petney, your hands up. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to note and if um, 
Mr. Reed is on the call or uh, somebody else from the New England Council. I'm, I believe the New England Council last week um, approved a draft letter or at least the concept of, of drafting a letter um, from the New England Council raising, you know, some of the, or just reminding, uh, restating some of the concerns or issues that they raised in, uh, originally. Um, the Mid-Atlantic Council may either want to take a look at that letter if it's been drafted or consider signing on to that letter um, because obviously, you know, this area is important uh, to the fisheries managed by both New England and Mid-Atlantic Councils. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, okay, Mike. Um, yeah, thanks. And so Eric's hand came up. Go ahead, um, Eric. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Pending is correct. The New England Council last week did approve um, a, a draft to be sent on, on this topic, and I, I don't I don't know if Mr. Hughes has it in his liaison report. Uh, it might have not might not have been ready for that, but uh, if if the council so desires, we'll be sure to get you a, a copy of that draft as it's it's already been approved. Okay. Um, Peter Hughes, did you have anything based on Eric's comment? It's in my re good morning, everybody. Uh, it's in my report, but it I didn't do not have the letter in my report. But okay. the motion that was made at the council meeting read that the council send the approved comment letter to NOAA regarding the Hudson Canyon National Marine Sanctuary nomination with additional figures and charts charts as discussed. So that was the motion. I have not, I, I, I saw some comment letters being circulated yesterday. Uh, I can go in and see if that was one of the letters. Um, but so that's the motion that was made at New England last week. Thank you. Mr. Okay. <clears throat> so let me ask, maybe let me ask you, Chris, where does that leave us? So, uh, um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So to Greg, so two things in terms of what uh, Greg said about the letter, our 2017 letter not appearing in the public record. Uh, Kylie will uh, check to make sure that in fact it's there. If not, we'll send it back to them again as a, as just this was a letter we sent you in 2017. Certainly, if the council wants to write another letter, uh, we could do that. Um, as I understand it. The letter that came, and I haven't seen the letter, so so Eric can Eric can help me with this. But um, as I understand it, the letter did not oppose the nomination. Um, just presented some additional information for folks to look at. If I understand that right, is that true? Uh, Eric, well, we 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 certainly we didn't oppose it, but we didn't support it either. But uh, yeah, we just added some. Uh, like Mr. Hughes mentioned some facts and figures and and, and sent it along. So, so with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I think what we could do is certainly, uh, again, um, make sure that they have our 2017 letter. Kylie's review indicates that we have no additional information that we can provide at this time. We certainly have now the letter that's coming from New England that might provide additional detail for, for folks, but Again, it's up to the council. I, I would suggest my recommendation is we're good at this point, but if folks think differently, now's the time to let us know. Yeah, okay. And yeah, you cut out for about 15 seconds uh, when you started speaking, so we, we didn't uh, so catch it. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, again, I don't know what's going on with my mics, but two things. First thing is that Kylie's going to review uh, the package or make sure that our uh, 2017 letter is uh, in the right hands, Noah, as part of the, uh, the comments. And uh, if not, make sure that they see that letter, get that in again. Uh, and again, in terms of what the, uh, the New England Council did, certainly we could do something similar, but our review of where we're at suggests that we really don't need to do that. So again, okay. so it's, it's, up to, uh, it's up to the council. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, Peter Hughes. Thank you. I did see a comment letter yesterday that was submitted by the Fisheries Survival Fund asking uh, that this area identified uh, be removed from the uh, sanctuary inventory. I don't know if that's something that would be considered lobbying by us, 
Um, but I don't know if that ask could be put into that letter. Thank you. Or put into a letter. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Chair, if I could. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, so our, our letter in 2017 was, was pretty strong, indicating that we oppose the nomination. Uh, if, in fact, folks want to write another letter, uh, we certainly can do that. I'm looking at, uh, let's see. I don't remember when we have to have the comments in by. We still have time. Kylie, if you're on, can you tell us when additional information has to be provided to NOAA? Yeah, actually, the comment deadline was February 7th. So, today, I mean, we can always submit uh, another letter in, in talking to the sanctuary staff. You know, it sounded like they're always happy to hear from the councils, but um, regarding the, the new information, um, yeah, that the request was specific to new information uh, relative to the 11th. Here. New information is the key part of that. So, um, again, it's up to the council. You want to you want to send something in? Yeah. And if so, we'd like to understand exactly what our position is. So, as Eric indicated, the New England position sounded neutral. Um, uh, but 2017 letter was not neutral. It's dead. Right, and so Eric and Mike, I think both brought up the idea that we could sign off on a letter from New England as well. If that's, we could do a joint. We can do a joint letter. Um, let me see. Eric's got his hand up. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, just just for your reference, the the draft uh, letter from New England is in our briefing materials for last week it's under tab 14 which is other business and the draft is in that it's a four page letter that's in that uh under that tab tab 14. okay thanks eric so let me see if anyone so i the way that i'm trying to i'm, I'm trying to right. digest this is that if there's new information for you know, look, just looking to council members to see if anybody has anything new they want to bring up. But as Chris said, you have to be pretty specific. There are no hands up, Chris. Um, so, uh, with that, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, yeah, Mr. yeah. I would suggest that uh, that we're we're in good shape at least for now, and so okay, we'll yeah, wait to see what happens next. Okay, yeah, we can do that. That sounds good to me. Okay, thank you. So the next item behind the tab is the Mid Atlantic uh, Council press release, similar to a press release that went out from our management partners. It relates to the uh, climate change scenario planning upcoming webinars. Uh, I hope that everyone on this call today saw this press release because we had wide distribution. Uh, we are encouraging folks to attend those web webinars uh, that begin on Monday, February 14th. We have no, another one scheduled for Wednesday, February 23rd, and a third one scheduled for Wednesday, March 2nd. And the details on the second part of that tell you exactly what we expect to talk about at those webinars. Uh, oceanographic drivers of change, biological drivers of change, social and economic drivers of change are the topics for each of those webinars. We have a climate change scenario planning webpage that you can go to as well and uh, to provide additional information if you need or have to answer any questions related to uh, what we plan to do with scenario planning. But um, the, uh, the actual, and in fact, Kylie has indicated to me that the background document for Web, webinar one was posted yesterday. So if you are interested, you can find that document on our website now. And remember, this is the, if you go through, if you look at the timeline that's in this press release, this is the exploration phase of this multi-year initiative. Any questions about that? Uh, I see Adam, Adam's hand. Go ahead, Adam. 
is there any specific role for council members beyond just part a participant as a member of the public? Uh, the answer, the direct answer is no, Adam. It's basically uh, we encourage council members to attend if they're interested, but uh, they'll, they'll be there just like any other member of the public. All right, thanks, Chris. And just just to let the council know, um, I do plan on trying to be at at these meetings. Um, are there any other questions? Any comments? Anyone from the public? Okay, I don't see anybody right now, Chris. Um, just to, uh, to, to further uh, to Adam's point, if uh, any council members interested in attending these webinars, then uh, let uh, Shelley know, and we'll put you on the TA for those particular meetings. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, thanks, Chris. The uh, the next item behind the tab is a very straightforward letter asking us uh, to basically. Oh, I'm not asking. It's basically telling us that at its December. Meeting the New England Council adopted as one of its priorities to responding dogfish um, are basically supporting the priority was to support a framework adjustment under the lead of the Mid-Atlantic Council for development. So if you go back to the first document that I that, uh, we went over this morning, you see in fact that we do have plans to look at responding dogfish trip limits. Uh, the way it's detailed in the that particular document now is that we have something scheduled for December as a white paper, which is something that uh, Jason has talked about uh, with the group before. Any questions about spiny dogfish before we move on? Any questions? Yeah, I don't see I don't see any hands right now, Chris. Okay, next item behind the tab. This is a uh, this is related to uh, a request by uh, our council at the December meeting for a leadership discussion between the councils, the two councils being the New England Council, the Mid-Atlanta Council, to talk about the Great South Channel Habitat Management Area, and particularly that area as it relates to surf clam fishery access. In fact, we did have that meeting um, as a result of that, uh, of that desire or motion by the council uh, that happened on January 14th. Uh, if you look at the document, you can see the folks that attended that particular meeting. Uh, we got up to speed as to exactly what uh, the Great South Channel Habitat Management Area was all about and the issues related to fishery or to the uh, Circlan Fishery Access. Uh, Jason, I'm Jason, Jessica and uh, Michelle from the New England Council uh, presented us with uh, that information and Jose helped us with well, uh, helped out as well. Um, so you can read the details of that um, discussion in the summary of that meeting. Uh, one of the things that we agreed to do uh, was send an email to our advisors, letting them know that meetings are happening up in New England re related to the topic and providing and that we provide an opportunity for them to comment. Uh, we did uh, do that. We also reached out to Garfo staff to indicate that this was going to be happening. And uh, as I understand it, I wasn't there, but the New England Council did discuss the topic at length at their meeting, their recent meeting. And if you could, Mary, put up the uh, motion that came out of that, that'd be great. I'd ask, um, just to give you a heads up, either Eric or Peter to speak to this motion once we have it on the screen. Um, I don't think there's anything that we, the Mid Atlantic Council, need to do at this point. But okay. basically, this is to indicate what New England Council decided to do uh, with that particular topic and um, relates to um, what uh, is happening relative to the EFP uh, that we talked about. And um, I don't know, Eric, do you have any comments related to this particular motion? Yeah, I've got both, both Eric and Peter's hand up. Um, why don't I start with the chairman and then we'll come to you, Peter. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mori. I mean, that, I appreciate putting the motion on the board. It's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, there is an existing EFP that took place there and 
the we received an update back in December of 2020 and haven't had any substantive uh, follow up to that. But uh, the council did agree that once we do have a uh, a report or a document that we can analyze that we would do so. And it's my understanding that at this point we have a uh, we have a draft of an update. That's what we have, and we're looking at that now. But uh, you know, the idea is exactly what's put forward in this motion. That uh, the existing EFP, we just want to check out what you know what that what that means. What's the you know is the purpose for us is to ascertain whether or not the utility of the study for management within within the Great South Channel uh, HMA is is of use to either extend the EF, existing EFP or to support other EFPs. So that, that that's I mean it's right there in front of you. That's that's what we did, and then we will be doing that and review that at our uh, the next habitat committee meeting, which I think is on the 17th of March. Okay, thanks, Eric. Um, Peter, uh, your hand went down. Did you have, did you want to add anything? Uh, Eric. Eric quantified it uh, perfectly. I don't have okay. anything to add. Thank you. All right. And so Chris, you're you're you were saying that there's no count there's no action that's needed right now. Exactly. Right. Okay. So the bottom line here would be stay tuned. You know, obviously the council's interested yeah. it happens as a result of New England Council uh, actions and uh, we'll keep the council informed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it sounds good. All right, I don't see any other hands. Is there anyone from the public? If I haven't asked already. Uh, okay, seeing no hands, Chris, it's back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, besides Chub Mackerel, I think Julia's favorite topic is wind. And she updates us every council meeting with uh, these memos that basically indicate what's happened since she last updated us relative to uh, wind energy development off the East Coast. Um, remember that we have in conjunction with the New England Council website that uh, we manage. So a lot, all of this information is also on the website. Remember at our December Council meeting, we uh, decided uh, as Council, we approved motions to send letters to GARPO regarding fisheries mitigation. Also a letter to BOOM regarding their central planning, proposed central Atlantic planning areas and coral protection and our coral protection area. How those uh, two intersected. And uh, those letters you can find in those if you uh, click on those links. We have a response from um, Ohm on um, the first one. We also have a, a response to our letter to Garville on the second one. Those I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, there's other information here about uh, uh, what doing. Uh, lease auction is going to be taking place on February 23rd. Talks about four fisheries meetings were also held. Um, some other things. So again, you can go to our website for more detail. Mary, if you could pull up the uh, supplemental um, material. The other uh, question that we had at our December meeting as a result of a presentation that we had on aquaculture, I think it was December. Anyway, we had a request for information on what's going on with aquaculture on the East Coast. These are the pilot projects uh, that were awarded in FY18 and 20. Um, I cannot speak to any of these. There's just details on the actual project title, who got the uh, grant and how much money uh, was involved. So you can look at those and see how, how that uh, looks for the East Coast. There's some interesting uh, topics there and certainly uh, if there's any additional questions uh, that we have about it, we can reach out to our uh, Aquaculture folks at Garfo, I'm sure they'd be able to help us. <coughs> um, the next um, item is the letter that I um, basically referenced a letter that we had sent to. Yeah, we didn't. I can't remember. Julie's on. I don't think we got a response to the letter, but we did see. So response. Um, so if you look at this, remember the concern was the fact that these wind energy areas overlapped 
the Frank R. Lautenberg deep sea coral zones. And you can see that on December, uh, in December, the uh, BOEM presented updates. Uh, presentation included these planning areas. We discussed at that meeting our concerns related to the overlap. They didn't seem to recognize that, in fact, the Frank R. Lautenberg deep sea coral protection area was there. So we reminded them of that. We sent them a letter. Um, and we also asked that those areas be removed from the planning areas. And um, in January, Bohm posted the Atlantic call area shown in the figure that Julius put together on the next page. We did get, we do see a reduction in the call area, 31% reduction. However, the areas that we were concerned about have not been removed. And um, if you go to Bohm's website to see if there's a reason why they weren't, um, all we could find was this. So remember that there is an intent that this call area will be further reduced into a wind energy area at some point and then be further reduced into individual lease areas over the next year and a half. So we'll continue to follow this and continue obviously to uh, to weigh in in terms of concerns related to overlap with the uh, with the deep sea coral area. And right, stop there is another letter. Uh, this is a letter, so we did get a letter from from Mike related to uh, our motions, uh, and uh, we sent that letter in on January 6. Uh, we had two specific recommendations. Council requested us to evaluate what extent the process uh, it announced with Bone to address fisheries mitigation, um, how that's going to work. Um, and we recommended that NIMS evaluate alternative or supplemental strategies that can implement improved fisheries analysis for mitigation efforts. So um, you can see Mike's response here discusses NIMS involvement, BOEM's involvement. Uh, last paragraph uh, basically says uh, we appreciate the recommendation, uh, continue to evaluate how BOEM's mitigation efforts align with our existing policies points out that there's a workload issue that we have to be concerned about and uh, possible and this will continue to explore opportunities to improve the data and analyses available to evaluate fisheries impacts and provide input to BOEM as it develops its fishery compensation guidance. So the bottom line is that BOEM is obviously going to be developing the compensation guidance. Uh, we can continue to track and see how that goes. We can continue to be involved as much as we can. But again, this is a this is a boom uh, thing. So, with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll stop. I have one last thing, and then I'll be done. But before I go to that, let's uh, let's see if there's any questions or comments about any of that stuff. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, I do see a hand. Kate Wilkie has her hand up. Go ahead, Kate. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, whoever's controlling the slides, would you please put up the maps of the um the central Atlantic planning area if possible. I'm just kind of curious, um, uh, Chris, you mentioned how in this, the most recent version of the maps, they did exclude the canyon areas, um, which were the discrete zones of the Frank R. Lautenberg coral protection area. So that's a good thing. And yet you mentioned that they didn't totally address our comments. And I think that relates to um, still continuing to have a planning area in the the broad zone of the coral coral area um, and I'm I'm not sure if the council uh, has plans to weigh in um, on on another round of comments based on these changes but I would just wonder if the preference would be if if you assume there's going to be wind in some of the um, development in some of these areas, would the council prefer that it be farther offshore rather than the eastern areas, which are more near shore and maybe have more fisheries conflict, um, with the caveat that perhaps there could be some sort of qualification that deep sea coral would not be damaged in the siting of specific wind projects. So just throwing that out there for consideration, uh, I don't, assume we're going to, you know, have a big discussion on it today, but I, I was just kind of thinking through um, looking at this map and just wanted to throw that out there. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kate. 
Mr. Yeah. Chair, I, yeah, go ahead, Chris. So, uh, uh, Julia, I don't know if you're on or not. Are you? Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me? Excellent. Yeah. So, uh, Julia's on. Julia drew this map, right? Julia, didn't you put this map together? Or did you pull it from a, a uh, foam thing? Um, I, I put the pieces together. Good. All right. So, can you? So now I'm a little confused. Can you address what Kate said re uh, regarding the discrete areas? And um, I think I, I thought I understood exactly what they had decided to do, which is nothing in response to our letter, but maybe uh, that's wrong. So could you address that? Um, no, that's correct. Um, so the red outline on the map is what the council saw in December during the Bowen presentation. And then the council wrote a letter saying that um, we had concerns that there was uh, the red areas were in the broad coral zone. Um, so the, you know, the discrete coral zones had already been removed by the time this was presented to the council in December. But then the council sent a letter saying that we wanted all of the coral zones to be excluded from wind energy development. Um, so we sent a letter to Boehm requesting that and then um, Boehm posted um, these updated draft call areas, which are the black dash line, posted those on their website sometime in late January. So the the parts that overlap with the coral zones didn't change. And that's what the, the red versus the black dash line is intended to illustrate. Um, and this is all feeding into a task force meeting that Boehm's going to hold on February 16th. Um, so, and the goal is for the task force to weigh in on these areas as well. And so there will be additional um, opportunities for, um, you know, further input and comments on these areas. So if the council wants to consider providing additional comments to BOEM on this, there's definitely still opportunities for that. Okay, thanks. Um, let me go to Eric. I've got Eric Reed and Peter Hughes. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to point out that, you know, you look at this chart here, you see where the two offshore areas are. And, you know, showing those areas is one thing, but what you don't know is where the export cables are going to go. How many they're going to be, where are they going to come from, where are they going to go, what habitat are they going to go through? And that's a concern. Because just because they've taken the, the uh, discrete areas out of this particular diagram, those cables have to go somewhere. And, you know, my guess is they're going to go right through because there, there's just no, uh, there's no other way around it. But that, that's something you never find out about until it's too late. But that's a, a huge concern. Put those cables from a long way offshore through those those zones to get to the beach. Thank you. All right, thanks, Eric. Uh, Peter Hughes. Thanks, Mr. Chair. What's also concerning is that these charts just appear on a website, and that we're not really given any notification that there's been updates or that you know it's. The, the BOEM website is not the easiest website to navigate. Um, but more concerning than, than, than what we have in front of us now, to me, is when they decide that they want to do a northern, um, at North Atlantic wind call area that would take up probably a considerable uh, amount of the deeper waters up uh, east of Hub Hudson Canyon area, um, which would also probably include the uh, the Hudson Canyon Nat National Marine Sanctuary that we just discussed. So um, there's really no um, there's there, there been there's been no involvement <clears throat> by us uh, in the council realm to help them identify areas um, that would, you know, uh, that would that would lessen conflicts. Um, so I just I'm just afraid that we're going to see this, uh, um, you know, a, a similar uh, action take place in uh, in the north, northern more Atlantic towards Hudson Canyon. So it's just it's just something very concerning. Thank you. 
Yeah, I appreciate that, Peter. Um, yeah, that's definitely a concern. Is there anybody else at this point? Anyone from the public? Joe Semino, go ahead, Joe. Thanks, Mike. I, I was just wondering about the task force. Uh, for some reason, Bohm didn't think that these areas were going to impact New Jersey, and so we had a fight to get a seat on the task force. But I'm just wondering if anyone else on the council, or, or you know, if anyone else on the council is on the task force, or if they if they know who from if their state is being represented. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate that, Joe. I I don't have an answer for you. I'd have to ask uh, folks in my office, as far as Maryland, where we where we stand on that. Um, but I do have a couple of hands that came up. Let me, uh, Kate Wilkie, and then um, Jim Fletcher. I'll come back to you in a minute. Go ahead, Kate. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I know that. Um... I have a, a list of organizations that are on it, um, the Virginia DEQ, the Marine Resources Commission, VIMS, uh, VCU, and um, Dominion Energy, but I don't know the names of the folks and I don't know other states, but from Virginia, those are, oh, and DHR, which I actually don't know who that is. I would have to look that up, but that's who I know from Virginia is on it. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Kate. Uh, Chris, Pat Savage. Go ahead, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, to answer Joe's question, uh, North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality, our, the, the uh, department that we're under, uh, is involved with this uh, task force. And uh, I know we have uh, one staff member uh, that, um, that that's involved. Um, other than that, I, I don't have any other details, but uh, just doing some quick checking. Uh, North Carolina is involved. Thanks. All right, thanks, Chris. I don't see any other hands from members of the council. Let me, so I'll go to the public, uh, James Fletcher. Go ahead, Jim. My question is twofold. If you put piles in the water to support the windmills, then the layers of water, different temperature, different larvae are going to be stirred up and resettled. That's one of the problems to me that hasn't been addressed, addressed where the larva normally settles now. These will completely destroy it or, or change it. And the other question is, we know that the electromagnetic fields affect the sharks and the elasma brights in the European windmills. Has anybody addressed that? Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, James. Um, let me see who I've got next. Uh, I, I don't have an answer for you uh, to your question, James, but maybe somebody else might be able to offer. Before I go to other members, members of the council, is there anyone else from the public? All right, so let me go to uh, David Stormer. Go ahead, David. Hi, yeah, good morning. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Just in response to Joe Samino, um, wondering if other states would be represented on the February 16th task force. I'm, I know I'm working with our coastal zones program. So, um, so Delaware, you know, should have a, should have a seat um, and a voice at that uh, February 16th um, task force meeting. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, Dan Farnham. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, food for thought that those those offshore areas, they're they're some of those areas are in excess of a thousand fathom. I mean, I don't see these windmills in that area being being pile driven. Um, I would I would be willing to bet they'd be anchored, and uh, I don't know what kind of configuration they use when they anchor windmills in that kind of depth. But I mean, think about a mile, you know, mile deep water. How many anchors and anchor lines you need and whatnot. Um, thank you. 
Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Anyone else, David, did you have a follow up? Your hand's still up. David Stormer. Okay. Your hand went down. Uh, Eric Reed. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be quick uh, to, to Mr. Farnham's, you know, point. Usually the arrays that I've seen that are floating the scope of an anchor line is about eight to one. So you do the math and to uh, Mr. Fletcher's question. Uh, what has been considered is whether or not the export cables are AC or DC current. Uh, DC current has less EMF than AC, but they are way more expensive. So that, that's been discussed, but it's not, uh, you're never going to know until the developers decide what they prefer, not what we prefer. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Eric. Anything else at this at this time? All right, I don't see any hands. Um, I'll turn it back to you, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be brief. This is a, uh, the last item uh, for my report this morning. It is it relates to the Northeast Trawl Advisory Panel membership. There's a document that uh, is supplemental to the ED tab. Remember, we've had a number of conversations over the last couple of meetings about NTAP, and um, we solicited for a uh, new uh, membership, and we did get some folks that were interested in being on this particular panel, and this is what it looks like now. So remember that this, uh, the membership on this panel includes folks that were appointed from the Mid-Atlantic Council, the New England Council, as well as the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. <laughs> We also have folks there that, uh, that are associated with the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. So uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd be glad to answer any questions about NTAP or any of the other materials that I presented this morning. Thanks. Yeah, so thanks, Chris. Um, I know that I approved um, this list, but is there anything that's needed from the council? Do we need a council support uh, approval for, no. for the list? No. Okay. Yeah, this is information only just to let folks know who, the, who these gotcha. folks are. Okay. All right. Any questions for Chris on on, on uh, NTAP? Okay. I don't see any hands. Anyone from the public? Jeff Kalin. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, morning, members of the council. I, just uh, not specifically on NTAP. Um, but just generally, a couple things. Um, you know, we talked about Jason's workload earlier, and and he has spent a tremendous amount of time uh, working with the industry on on both the ILEX, um assessment and, and the butterfish assessment, which are, are wrapping up right now. So, just wanted to give a shout out to Jason um, for that work, and also just wanted to thank Chris and uh, Bob Beal. I think he's on. Um, we, uh, you know, we talked in December about the fact that we probably need a letter in support of our SCUP MSC certification process. Um, it looks like the public report will be published by the beginning of March, which is a green light. And part of that process requires uh, the council and the commission in this case, uh, because SCUP is managed by both entities, um, to uh, support the the um, action plan that uh, we've come up with, uh, Seafreeze and Lunds are the client group. So uh, that action plan focuses on two of the um, SCUP uh, discard priorities that were identified by the council and, um, and they're embodied in, in this letter. And I just wanted to thank uh, Chris and, and Carson, who's done a whole lot of work in support of this assessment. Um, over the last, well, I think we started in, in April, so <laughs> so uh, that's all. I just wanted to thank several people for, for their help with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, uh, you know, identify the fact of the council that, you know, the staff is, is spending a lot of time with some of us on these special projects um, that don't necessarily get reflected um, in, the, in the reports every month, but um, we really appreciate all the support we've, re we've received uh in this case and uh and in several cases um earlier too of course so that's it thanks mr chairman yeah yeah i appreciate that um 
Yeah, I mean, I so yeah, thank you for the uh, recognition of the the hard work that that people are doing. I, you know, I I don't think we do that enough um, to give folks credit for for the work, the hard work that they do. So I appreciate that, Jeff, for bringing that up. Um, is there anyone else from the public or the council before we go ahead? We're going to probably take a break here. I think, after, Chris, you're done, right? There's no nothing else on your tab. I'm done. Okay. All right. I don't see any hands at this time, so let's take a uh, let's take a ten minute break if that's okay with everyone. We'll come back at ten thirty five, uh, and we'll pick up with um, other report outs. So we'll come back at 1035. Thanks. Hey there, just uh, FYI, someone's unmuted and talking in the background.
Okay, welcome back everyone. It's uh, 1036. I'd like to get started for the rest of our agenda for today. Um, the next item that we have on our agenda, through my notes, uh, we have organization reports and I'd like to start with the, uh, the regional office. Mike, are you there for a report? I am Mr. Chairman, thank you. Yeah, there you go. All right. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everybody. I um, have a few things to touch base on, and then I'll be um, happy to take questions if there are any. Um, want to let everybody know that um, as a result of uh, President Biden's um, proclamation last fall on the uh, Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Monument, um, my office has reengaged with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, to begin discussing and starting to develop the monument management plan um, that is um, that is due uh, by September 2023, um, as well as um, fishing regulations uh, that are required uh, under the terms of the proclamation. Uh, we talked about the fishing regulations uh, a little bit in December at the uh, priority setting uh, meeting, um, but I wanted to let people know that in our discussions with Fish and Wildlife Service, on the monument management plan, um, you know, the kind of first step uh, in that process, as with, with many actions of this type, is a scoping process, scoping period where um, <clears throat> the agencies would uh, reach out to stakeholders and, and collect public comment on, uh, on on issues of importance. And so I've encouraged Fish and Wildlife Service as we begin the scoping process uh, to try to engage through the and leverage the council meeting uh, process. Uh, as good opportunities to engage with important stakeholders um, in, in the monument area. And so uh, we are talking about April uh, as a, a good starting point for some of the scoping uh, process. And so um, I'll be in touch with, with Chris and Mike on this, but um, we're hoping that we can provide an opportunity at the April Council meeting uh, for Fish and Wildlife Service and us to, to engage and, 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 and talk about the monument management plan and, and get some feedback from stakeholders. So just putting that on everybody's radar. <clears throat> um, at the last council meeting, um, we presented information on sea turtle bycatch in uh, in some council managed uh, fisheries, including uh, long fin squid and summer trawl, uh, summer flounder trawl fisheries. And as we mentioned uh, that during that briefing, uh, we're considering uh, potential actions under the Endangered Species Act to, to reduce injury and mortality of sea turtles uh, that are accidentally captured in those trawl fisheries. Um, today, I just want to remind everybody that we're holding public webinars uh, starting next week. Um, February 16th is the first one. Uh, then we have uh, two additional ones on uh, March 1st and March 14th um, to obtain public input on bycatch reduction measures that uh, we might consider. We're also accepting written comments until May 31st. Uh, so there will be an opportunity at the April council meeting uh, if the council wishes to to have a draft or, or discuss uh, submitting comments, there'll be that opportunity as well. Uh, we also have a lot of information up on our <clears throat> Greater Atlantic Regional uh, Office webpage um, for more information about the issue and, and how to provide input. Uh, another protective species related issue, uh, we're currently planning uh, an update for the Harbor Porpoise Take Reduction Team. Um, which will be March 24th from 4 to 5.30 uh, in the afternoon, uh, just to go over some recent abundance estimates, some bycatch trend and estimates uh, and updates on some special projects that have been uh, going on. Um, take re remains below the potential biological removal limit, uh, so we don't anticipate having to take any action, um, but we may discuss with the TRT uh, the scientific permitting process, just to make people aware of that. Uh, you're probably all uh, aware, but uh, on January 12th, uh, in response to a request last year from, from the council, uh, we published an interim rule to reduce the domestic annual harvest of Atlantic mackerel, uh, reduce the, the harvest for 2022 from 17,312 tons uh, to 4,963 tons. And this was uh, in part based on the council's SSC uh, review that determined mackerel remain overfished and overfishing is occurring. Uh, and the August uh, request of the council that we take action to reduce mackerel harvest. Um, just to note that that action as an interim rule uh, is in force for 180 days, uh, but we can renew it uh, for the remainder of the, of the calendar year uh, while the council completes its work on 
uh, macro uh, rebuilding, uh, which I guess is now an amendment, so the, the macro rebuilding action. Uh, for those of you interested in Northeast ground fish, um, Amendment 23 process uh, continues. Uh, we published the notice of availability for Amendment 23 on January 14th. Um, and so the comment period on that uh, amendment uh, closes on March 15th. Um, the EPA published the notice of availability of the EIS on January 21st on the comment period and it's February 20th. Uh, and we're finalizing um, the proposed rules, so we hope to get that published uh, here pretty soon um, so that people can comment on the actual regulations uh, as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, for whiting uh, fishery interest, on February 2nd, we published the final rule implementing specifications uh, and measures for um, the, multi the small mesh multi-species or whiting fishery, um, in part based on the management track assessment 2020 changed some of the possession limits. Um, see Atlantic herring on January 7th, we published a temporary rule adjusting the 2022 herring specs. Uh, that was effective upon filing on January 4th. Um, and on February 4th, we implemented a 2000 pound herring possession limit in management area three uh, based on um, catch there. Uh, we're required to uh, reduce the possession limit uh, to 2,000 pounds when 98% of the sub ACL of the, for the area is is projected to be reached. Uh, so that happened pretty quick, uh, and that temporary rule uh, continues through the end of the calendar year. Uh, for skates, on January 18th, we published a proposed we published proposed catch uh, specs in FR for the 2022 skate fishing year. Um, the current uh, limits. Um, rolled over from framework adjustment eight and expire on April 30th. Uh, well, actually those will roll over uh, if we don't have the specs in place. Um, but comments on the proposed rule are due uh, next week, February 17th. And I guess we do expect, uh, sorry, to get the final specs in place for, for May 1. So that shouldn't be an issue. Um, I think that's it, Mr. Chairman, unless there's any questions. All right, thanks, Mike. I uh, appreciate that. Let me see if anyone has any questions. Got a couple hands up. Chris Moore, we'll start with you and then uh, Chris Bat Savage after Chris. Go ahead, go ahead, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mike, I don't know if you heard me given the mic issue that I was having earlier uh, as it related to the timeline and status of our actions and amendments and I referenced three amendments. None of those amendments appear in your report. And I'm just wondering if you have any comments as to where we're at with those three, three being excessive shares, squid mackerel butterfish, black sea bass commercial allocation amendment. Right. So, um, yeah, go ahead, Mike. There's, yeah, there's nothing um, in my report on those. We don't have anything published or, or anything, but I think the uh, black sea bass um, commercial allocation amendment is under review. Um, I think everybody knows, you know, we are constrained in resources and the person who works summer flounder scup and black sea bass has been uh, very much focused the last uh, few months on harvest control rule and uh, recreational management measures uh, issues that were discussed at length yesterday. Um, so, um, you know, that's, we're trying to balance our priorities on that. Um, on the excessive shares amendment, uh, I don't have an update on that, but I will stall a little bit and see if there is a response that may come through. Um, and what was the third one, Chris? The other one is actually in uh, our court. That's the squid macro butterfish one uh, related to goals, objectives, and LX permits. So yeah, you know, our, yeah, our staff's been working with Jason, and and uh, we're looking forward to getting. Um, you know, once Jason is able to clear his plate of all the other things he's working on um, and get that resubmitted to us, then then we'll be we'll get moving on the on the LX amendment. Great. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Chris. Uh, let's go next to Chris Bat Savage. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Mike, for the. Uh... The summary uh, look, looking at the, uh, at the summary, um, I appreciate the. Uh, you know, kind of the overview of quota transfers uh, that, that occurred during the, the 
last month or so and uh, kind of and just want to thank you and your staff for all the help on on those quota transfers, uh, particularly bluefish. Uh, I know we made a bunch. Uh, hopefully we'll make uh, fewer next this coming year with the higher uh, quota commercial quotas uh, uh, in, in place. But I also had a question um, regarding uh, uh, the summer flounder quota transfers. I guess there was a retroactive uh, transfer between <clears throat> Massachusetts and Connecticut. And I, I think I remember that being a possibility of having transfers uh, non safe harbor uh, transfer is done after December 15th, but I wasn't aware of the details on on how, how that works. I, I don't know if you can maybe provide some information uh, uh, about that. Thanks. Yeah, I don't have Chris, you know, I appreciate the, the shout out to staff. I know they work really hard with all of the state, um, you know, staff uh, on, on quota transfers and try to get those done as quickly as possible. Um, you know, I think the, the post season retroactive ones are a challenge. Um, the December 15th isn't, you know, there's nothing hard and fast about that. It's really just, um, we, we ask for, uh, you know, the request to come in by that date so that we have, you know, 2 weeks to try to get the, the request uh, approved and processed and published. So that it can be effective within the calendar year. Uh, there are some cases where we just don't get to it. Uh, and so I don't. Know the specifics of that uh, retroactive one between Mass and Connecticut, um, but I suspect it may be that um, you know circumstances beyond everyone's control. The the request came in late, um, or or we just were you know weren't able to process it as quickly as we we normally would, and so it ended up publishing uh, in the 2022 calendar year. So it ended up being retroactive. Um, I suspect that's that's what it was. All right, thanks, Mike. Um, any other questions? <clears throat> okay, I don't see any hands. Uh, Mike, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for your report. And I'm going to go ahead and go on to the next report, which is the Science Center. John, are you with us? I am, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah, Mr. there Chair. you go. All right. Okay, excellent. Um, so science center report, uh, we continue to do a lot of work uh, at the science center. Uh, our ability to work <laughs> in our facilities, our deputy director, Nicole Cabana has the ability to approve those activities. So many of our laboratory um, and a vast majority of our field activities have been underway. Um, we are still waiting for a budget, our current continuing resolution expires on February 18th. Um, I did hear yesterday that the House passed another continuing resolution to March 11th. That does begin to create um, some concerns for us regarding our operations. Um, some of our you know, budget purchases, there's limits. So we're starting to get concerned about some of our survey operations during the year. But at this point, there's nothing, no changes. We're still planning our full, full survey uh, set. In terms of surveys, again, our goal is to be fully successful. Um, you know, the three challenges that we continue to face are our day at sea allocation through uh, office marine and aircraft operations continues to decline, um, and that puts pressure on all of our survey programs. Uh, for particularly our protected species work and our ecosystem monitoring surveys, which provides uh, data that goes into several of the Mid-Atlantic Council stock assessments. Um, the second challenge is, you know, COVID still continues to present a risk, um, and we are working with OMAO and our contract vessels to reduce these risks. And the, you know, the decrease in in caseloads in the region is a is a good sign uh, for all of us. Um, and then we are still under a CR, which is, you know, could potentially start to create some funding bottlenecks for us in terms of surveys. Um, and, you know, there are other questions that we have regarding our operations and the CR, but I think it's premature to go into those. Um, on the budget front, our survey costs continue to increase. 
um, and our survey budgets are flat or declining. And this has been an issue for a number of years. Um, and I, I want to raise it here again, just to um, you know let everybody know that this puts all of our surveys under pressure, including the NEMAP VIMS survey and the NEMAP Maine New Hampshire survey. Um, we have the, you know, in the president's budget, there was a request for additional survey funding. The Senate mark uh, indicated that that funding uh, should be used to meet, uh, some of that funding should be used to meet funding shortfalls in the in the VIM survey and the Maine New Hampshire survey. Um, but we have been working with the leads of those surveys to consider what would their plans be if there are no funding increases. Um, and so that those conversations are actively ongoing. Um, I hope we don't get into that situation, but we we might depending on uh, what happens with our FY22 budget. Um, Chris, uh, the executive director mentioned that the NTAP, uh, Northeast Fishery Science Center is still fully engaged. They're planning their next meeting um, sometime in March. Uh, the field work, which is planned for this year, will be led by VIMS, um, and they are conducting a project entitled Quantifying the Impact of a Restrictor Rope on the Composition Rate and Size Distribution of Catch Derived from a Bottom Trawl Survey. The working group that's sort of planning that work specifically has been meeting regularly uh, to come up with a sort of a, a field plan and an analysis plan. And then the field work is planned for the spring and fall of this year. In terms of our observers, uh, you know, observer deployments continue um, as they have for the past several, you know, as they have since we, the waiver was listed. Um, we continue to focus on safety. Uh, most, if not all, observers are vaccinated. Um, there are uh, protocols in place. So if there's concerns about COVID on a vessel that the trip is waived, um, we continue to operate uh, as safely as we can. Um, the observer training is ongoing. Uh, we have been uh, having the trainings access our facilities, so the, the instruction is, is primarily on site. Um, we do use some remote instruction in very specific um, situations. Uh, again, uh, at sea monitoring is not an issue for the Mid Atlantic Council, but we are uh, working to train the at sea monitors for the New England groundfish fishery, and we will be updating the, the, the training schedule. Currently, we have it posted through September, and we'll be updating that soon uh, further out. There is a, a data backlog in terms of the processing of observer trips. Uh, the waiver resulted in a loss of a number of observers. Um, the lack of data coming in resulted in a loss of a number of our debriefers. Um, then we got the observers back out to sea, and now we're uh, building up our our debriefer core again to get back up to our ability to process the observer data, um, you know, how in, a, in timely manners. Um, in terms of our assessments, um, all of the working groups are continuing to meet. Uh, we've heard already a little bit about the ELEX working group and the butterfish working group. We also have a, a haddock working group, which is winding down their work. Uh, American Place, Spiny Dogfish, Black Sea Bass, Bluefish, and Atlantic Cod are underway. There's also a working group looking at the application of state-based models in stock assessments. And then we're currently soliciting uh, working group members for Golden Tilefish, Sea Scallop, and Yellowtail Flounder. Uh, the 2022 to 2026 assessment schedule, uh, we finalized at the NRCC meeting in November, and that is posted on the NRCC web page um, and the assessment oversight panel will be meeting uh, on February 24th to look at um, assessments for Atlantic herring and southern New England mid-Atlantic winter flounder. Cooperative research uh, is very very active. Um, two updates there. Uh, uh, the cooperative research program has been working closely with some of the assessment working groups to bring study fleet information to those working groups. 
Uh, the two examples are the American Place Assessment and the ELEX Assessment, um, and they are looking to recruit uh, new study fleet members um, in spring of 2022. So that that program and those data are um, being used, uh, being contributed to assessments, which is an exciting sort of development for those for that program. Um, and then the co cooperative research branch will host a, a workshop in March uh, to look at um, sort of the impacts of offshore wind on fishing operations. Uh, the workshop is a, it's a project based workshop, so it's not open to the public, um, but there are a number of representatives of broad sort of diversity of fishing industry members and academics to, to look at the impacts of offshore wind on fishing operations. In terms of offshore wind, we've already heard that there is a lot going on. Um, from a science center perspective, uh, we've been working with University of Massachusetts Dartmouth uh, to set up a simulation experiment for our bottom trawl survey. Uh, the first workshop was held at the end of January. Uh, the second workshop is uh, scheduled for February. The intent is to develop a simulation of the bottom trawl survey design and then you know calculate indices from that simulation and then put wind farms into the survey design to understand what the potential impacts could be from losing survey areas to wind energy developments and then also to evaluate different survey uh, designs and strategies to mitigate those developments so it's a we we see the using the simulation approach um, as a as a way to evaluate the impact of wind energy development on our surveys, uh, for all of our surveys, uh, we have 13 surveys that are going to be impacted by wind energy development. Um, but we're moving forward with bottom trawl survey at this point. Um, the our ecosystems group um, they continue to work on their ecosystem and socioeconomic profiles, um, and they're contributing those profiles. Um, in the research track stock assessment process for the Mid-Atlantic Council, um, that would be the bluefish and the black sea bass. So you'll be hearing more about that. Um, and the, the, the ecosystem and socioeconomic profile work is going to link into the state of the ecosystem report, which is already provided to the council. So we're trying to trying to continue to develop the 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 backbone of ecosystem and socioeconomic information for the council to use both you know more strategic level state of the ecosystem report and then a more tactical level in specific stock assessments our climate work continues um, our the northeast regional action plan uh, was completed and there's a summary of work that was uh, completed over the first five years of our regional action plan and I can make that available to the council um, and then the sort of the what we're calling version two is currently uh, being prepared for public review and we continue to work closely with the geophysical fluid dynamics laboratory to bring their new climate models uh, to bear on climate ready decision making in the Northeast region. Uh, in terms of protected species, the, the decision support tool, which has been used to evaluate entanglement risk um, in the lobster and Jonah crab fishery is being extended to incorporate all fixed gear fisheries um, as a way to evaluate risk. Um, there are a lot of data challenges with this for the gillnet fisheries in particular, um, but the group is, is working hard on that issue um, and, and planning that the uh, update the tool to have it ready uh, for the take reduction team in their in their next meetings. And then our gear research team continues to work with fishers on the on the rope list or on demand fishing techniques. Um, and those uh, work with individual fishers is occurring in Maine, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, North Carolina, and Georgia. Um, and just a reminder, you know, we put out our monthly science highlights. It's a subscription type service. And if anyone would like to receive those um, and, and would like information about how to subscribe, please let me know. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thanks for the report. Um, looks like Michelle uh, Michelle Duvall. Go ahead, Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, John, for that 
Awesome report. I just had one question about the, um, you mentioned the decrease in, in survey days through um, OMAO, OMAO. And, you know, is that due to the fact that there's not enough days to go around or is it, you know, because the increasing costs of those days are, you know, eating into the number of days that you all are able to schedule? I mean, those, those are, they're, they're the flip side of the same coin. Um, but, you know, every year OMAO makes a determination of how many sea days will be available. Um, and then every year, NOAA Fisheries gets a certain percentage of those sea days. And so the number of sea days that will be available um, continues to decline. And that's, you know, largely driven by budget. Thanks. All right. Thanks for that. Um, anyone else have any questions for John? Yeah, Greg, uh, Greg DiDomenico. Go ahead, Greg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, uh, Dr. Hare. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can, Greg. Good morning. It's good to hear your voice. Uh, good to hear yours. Um, <clears throat> wanted to thank you uh, for um, hiring a facilitator uh, for the ELEX assessment. Um, I, to my knowledge, it's never happened before, but I will tell you that it was never more needed over this past 6 or 8 months than in the ELEX assessment. Um, so I wanted to thank you for that and I, and I, and I think that, um, he may be able to, um, make sure that there's a more cooperative, um, situation for the industry to participate. I certainly um, appreciate what he's done so far, but I think we have a lot more work to do uh, to truly make sure that the industry is a valued partner. So I look forward to your continued help on that, but I would also ask you that will he be supplying or writing a final report? Uh, and would that report be something that the Mid Atlantic Council or the CCC or the NRCC? be the best the best venue to analyze that and perhaps make some serious changes to the way we do things with assessments. Yeah, so thank you for your comment, Greg. Um, and I, I, I appreciate the recognition of, you know, the one of the goals of the redesign stock assessment process. One of the NRCC's goals was to be more inclusive of participants perspective and information, and that includes industry participants, industry perspectives, and industry um, information. The, the NRCC, and you know, I can speak from the Northeast Fishery Science Center perspective, believes that that inclusion leads to better science, um, which leads to better management. Um, and this, you know, the shift, this more inclusive uh, stock assessment process um, requires us to change our, our processes, um, and you you inferred sort of how our working groups work together, um, and these both take time and commitment. And so, you know, at a, as a gen, at a general statement, uh, you know, Northeast Fishery Science Center will take the time and learn the lessons that we need to uh, to make the improvements to this more inclusive stock assessment process. Um, you know, in terms speaking specifically to the ELEX assessment. Um, the facilitator, you know, it was a joint, it was Northeast Fishery Science Center and the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council. So, um, you know, I, 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 I'm sure that you would include your thanks for the facilitator to Mid-Atlantic Council and Chris Moore as well, because, you know, Chris uh, and the Mid-Atlantic Council made that happen. And I agree that, you know, adding that um, facilitator to that group was a critical step. Um, and I think there's lessons we can learn from that and, and, and think about whether that type of facilitation is needed going forward um, in other assessments. Um, in terms of that working group specifically, uh, it was a diverse group of uh, scientists, diverse group of expertise at the table. Um, and we encountered challenges both in the process um, and working group dynamics. Um, and the, the process challenges that we faced were, were largely around the data access issue. Um, and we, we weren't, you know, we didn't prepare well enough for that at the beginning. 
Um, we needed to make some changes midstream. Um, we needed to extend the assessment time frame. Um, we we worked in that specific situation to resolve the data access issues, but it still a has the potential to, to come into play in other research track assessments. So we continue to, to work uh, very hard on that, you know, aspects of the process. And then in terms of the working group dynamics, as you mentioned, we brought in the facilitator. So getting to your question, um, you know, the working group is completing their work. Um, so, I, you know, I think it's a little premature to make um, specific commitments to the next steps as to whether we would engage the facilitator to, to write a report or present something to the NRCC, but it's certainly um, it's an idea that Chris and I have discussed, um, and that you know we will continue to discuss. And when we have a specific plan, um, not sure the best way to let the council know what that specific plan is, but we will we'll be sure to do so. So thank you for the question, and thank you for your support for the assessment process. Thank you, John, and I, and I and I do hope that we make some, um, what I think are <coughs> are well needed structural changes to this process. As you recall, <clears throat> our involvement in this process uh, started off on a pretty controversial foot. Um, it's been going on for quite a while. Um, our concerns, I think, have been um, documented, and quite frankly have come uh, have been grounded in in truth uh, as exhibited throughout this entire year of this process so um i do hope you think about how we can learn from this and make some serious structural changes um and hope this type of this situation just doesn't repeat itself in any other uh assessments so Thank you for your support, but I'll also ask you for your follow through and some accountability in this process. So thank you again. You're welcome. And yeah, you know, and I think the, you know, we will continue to work on improving the process and we will continue to work on, you know, improving the support to the working groups. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thanks for that back and forth. Uh, Jason didn't. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to touch on some of those resource discussions earlier and just, um, I think it seems like, you know, that will continue to be, um, you know, a, a major issue for successful stock assessments going forward. And for the 2023 macro management track assessment, the execution of the that um, late late spring, early summer Ecomon survey will be critical. I know la I think last year their survey report indicated they had less days planned than, uh, or they got less days than kind of they originally planned. They ended up dropping southern um, areas and you know did okay up north where it might be most critical for macro. Um, but you know, just kind of an example of every you know survey ends up being critical for something, and as resources um, either dwindle related you know, relative to costs, um, you know, it, you know things have the potential to be impacted. I know there's been a fair bit of discussion about you know concerns about um, the port side sampling and 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 you know sufficient sampling for you know, that feeds into any of the the um, you know, age-based assessments that are depending on those on, on the good length sampling at the port. So, um, you know, I mean, it may be obvious, but I think just aware that those resource constraints will have, um, you know, direct impacts eventually for various assessments and, and their precision. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Jason. Mr. Chair, if I may comment. Yeah, please do. Go ahead, John. Yeah, and thank you for that, Jason. I guess, you know, the message that I'm, you know, maybe I'll just be blunt. Um, you know, you said that, you know, the resource constraints, you know, will have, uh, will, you know, create limitations in the future. I think we're at that future. 
Um, and so, you know, again, if, if we need to sort of ask the NEMAP VIM survey and Maine, New Hampshire survey to, to step back, uh, you know, cut their operations down to one season, if we need to take more of our surveys um, out of the schedule to be able to meet the days at seas that are made available to us, those, you know, those decisions are, are upon us. Um, and so maybe maybe we need to set aside a little bit of time at the next NRCC meeting to sort of have a conversation of, of you know, how do we go for, you know, depending on the, how the FY22 budget plays out, how do we go forward in a, in a very uh, constraining resource environment and do the science and management that we need to do. But it's, uh, it's upon us. Yeah, thanks, John. Um... Yeah, I think that would be a good discussion at the NRCC. Sorry, I just I got cut off for a second. Uh, I don't see any other hands. Uh, was there anybody else that had any questions for John? Before we move on. <laughs> Okay, seeing none at this time, John, thanks for your report. Uh, and we're gonna turn to the next John and go to the Office of General Counsel, John Almeida. Thank you, Mr. Chair, can you hear me all right? Yeah, I hear you great. So John, I have to step away for about a minute. Um, yep. is your, your report's gonna take a couple minutes? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna step away. I'll be I'll be back in, in a minute or two. And, okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, the first thing on my report is the New York summer flounder litigation. Um, as you may recall, the state of New York filed a lawsuit challenging the recent Amendment 21 to the summer flounder FMP. And then along with that, the 2021 specifications that for the first time used the new formulas, the new state um, quota formulas, uh, from Amendment 21. Uh, that case has been fully briefed before the court since April of 21. Um, and at this point, we're waiting for a decision from the court. Uh, the update is that since our last meeting, um, with the agreement of both sides, New York amended its complaint to substitute the 2022 specifications for the 2021 specifications, because the basis for that challenge is the same, the use of that Amendment 21 formula. Um, and so now the case is challenging Amendment 21, the, the amendment itself, the regulations uh, from that amendment, and the 2022 summer flounder specifications. So that was, you know, done with the agreement of both parties. Uh, the case is fully briefed before the court, and we're just waiting for a decision. Uh, river herring litigation. We only have one active case at this point relating to river herring. Uh, and that's the one brought in the District of Columbia by the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, and that case, if you may recall, is about the 2019 NIMFS determination that ESA listing was not warranted for alewife or blueback herring. Um, at this point, the case is fully briefed before the court, and there's oral argument scheduled for later this month, February 22nd. There's going to be oral argument on that case. Um, you may recall the two cases on industry funded monitoring uh, that challenge the New England Council's industry funded monitoring amendment. Uh, the first case, um, both of these cases, NIMFS won in the district court and they're currently on appeal. The first case uh, brought by Loper Bright Fisheries, um, this was the one that's brought in the District of Columbia. And um, like I said, th this case is now on appeal. It's in the DC Circuit Court of Appeals and um, it's fully briefed and there was oral argument yesterday uh, in the DC Circuit on that case. The second case brought by Relentless Incorporated, um, that's the one that was brought in the District of Rhode Island, um, is currently on appeal in the First Circuit and the parties are in the middle of briefing the appeal. And that should be wrapped up. All the papers, you know, all, the, all the briefs will be filed by March 11th. Um, right whale litigation. This is something that's um, definitely kept us busy 
uh, <laughs> over the last several months, a lot of cases relating to right whales. Um, we have the case up in Maine brought by the Maine Lobstering Union. Um, you may recall that the district court entered an injunction against NIMFS enforcing the LMA-1 restricted area, and NIMFS appealed this decision to the First Circuit. Um, at this point, the case is moving forward simultaneously in the First Circuit and in the District of Maine. We're expecting the appeal to be briefed by the end of February with oral argument likely in the First Circuit in either April or May. And the district court is also unfolding with um, briefings, you know, through through the spring and beginning of July, we should be wrapped up with the district court summary judgment briefings. Um, and then in the District of Columbia, we have the Conservation Law Foundation Center for Biological Diversity case before Judge Boesberg. Um, that case is in, uh, has, you know, it's been going on for a couple of years, but it's now in a new phase where it's challenging the recent rulemaking, uh, MMPA rulemaking and the biological opinion for the fisheries. Um, uh, right now we're in the middle of summary judgment briefing and um, NIMS will be filing its opening brief the beginning of next week. Also in the District of Columbia and also before Judge Boesberg is a case brought by the Maine Lobstermen's Association and that also challenges the uh, recent biological opinion and the MMPA rule. Um, that case is a, a little bit behind the CLF CBD case. Um, where the opening brief, the plaintiffs will be filing their opening brief um, currently March 21st, and then that briefing will continue through the beginning of June. Um, and then finally, in the District of Columbia, <laughs> another right whale case, um, pro se litigant Max Strahan. You may recall he filed a lawsuit in the District of Columbia. Um, and most recently, Mr. Strahan filed a motion seeking a temporary restraining order against fix, fixed gear fisheries. Um, earlier this week, Judge Kelly denied this motion. Uh, also this week, NIMS filed a motion to dismiss this action. Um, and that the briefing for that will take place over the next probably two months. Um, so a lot of right whale action uh, in the courts. Um, finally, you may recall uh, I've been giving reports on the Oceana sea turtle litigation, the case relating to the uh, scallop biological opinion. Um, NIMS issued a revised scallop biological opinion in June of 2021. Um, and then, you know, the parties have just been figuring out what happens with the litigation now that that happened, now that there's a new <laughs> biological opinion in place. Um, since our last meeting, the parties reached a settlement agreement by which um, NIMS has agreed to publish on its website the number of observed interactions between scallop dredges and sea turtles over the next five years, and also to pay attorney's fees to Oceana as part of this settlement agreement. Um, that's all I have to report today. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Okay, thanks, John. Um, yeah, I appreciate your report. I'm scrolling through my list. Let's see if anyone has any questions for John. Anyone from the public? All right, I don't see anything, John. You did a hell of a job. No, no questions coming your way. All right, uh, All right. Yeah. thanks, Mike. All right, yeah, thanks for your report. Um, let's go next to Noah's Office of Law Enforcement, and we have Caleb here with us, right, Caleb? Uh, I'm here, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. There you go. I was just looking for your name. Yep. Yeah, we hear you fine. Sounds good. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to start um, by mentioning two uh, Department of Justice pub, um, um, announcement uh, of, of indictments that went public two weeks ago. 
I, I apologize for the repetition. I, I did mention this uh, last week at the New England Fishery Management Council meeting, um, but uh, both are still open investigations, um, and I'm very limited in what I can comment on beyond what's publicly available. But um, Mr. Chairman, I, I might mention the two indictments and then stop briefly there for questions before moving on. If that's okay with you. Yeah, we, we, whatever you're comfortable with, we can do that if that's if that works for you. Okay, well, start there. Um, first, on Friday, January 29th, um, last month, <clears throat> Department of Justice announced that five fishermen from Maine, one from New Hampshire, along with a corporation, were charged with conspiracy, mail fraud, and obstruction of justice in connection with a multi-year scheme to sell unreported Atlantic herring and falsifying fishing records. Um, the other one that went out a little bit earlier in the week, um, the public announcement anyways, um, was on uh, uh, Wednesday, January 27th. Um, there, Christopher Winkler was charged with one count of conspiracy to commit mail fraud, to obstruct the National Oceanic and Atmospheric, Atmospheric Administration through the falsification of fishing logs, and to unlawfully frustrate NOAA's efforts at regulating federal fisheries. Um, so I'll pause there if anyone has any comments. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, and I know that you're limited to what you can, you know, how in depth you can get into your into the conversation. But um, let me go to Michelle Duvall. Go ahead, Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Caleb, I didn't know if you could comment on just the the volume of herring that was involved in that or or not. I don't know it. I don't know if I can comment on it, but I, I can tell you I don't know it. Um, actually, I, I, I take that back. I've only read what's in the uh, public announcement, um, and I believe it's in there. I don't want to... Um, um, Say something that's um, in conflict with, with what's in the public announcement. So I would direct you to that. That's um, both for the, the the Herring indictment and the uh, Christopher Winkler indictment. The the links to those DOJ public press releases are in the um, the, the the OLE written report accompanying this meeting. I, I noticed that that's up on the uh, council website. Thank you, Mary. So I, I would I would direct you there. I believe that volume is listed in that um, um, press release. If not, then I, I, I can't release it. I apologize. Thanks for that. I see it and got it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Caleb. Um, since we're paused here, let's see if anyone else has any questions before we go back to completion, uh, finish up the report. Did you have um, other things you wanted to uh, cover with us today, Caleb? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a, a yeah, couple please. Highlights. Go ahead. Okay. Yep. Okay, going. Um, uh, one highlight not included in the highlight section for the written report um, for this meeting. We wanted to mention um, the NED uh, Northeast Division of OLE conducted a joint operation in the Calais, Maine port of entry last week on the U.S. Uh, uh, Canadian border. Eastern U.S. Canadian border. Um, the operation spans six days and nights, um, in which our special agents and uh, enforcement officers targeted large amounts of Canadian seafood entering the U.S., supplying holiday and um, seasonal demand. The joint operation involved OLE, Maine Marine, Maine Marine Patrol, U.S. Coast Guard, and the FDA. OLE personnel inspected 21 refrigerated shipments in which 59 violations have been identified at this time. Four of these are seafood import monitoring program related um, and other entries, uh, uh, other entries by other uh, importers and exporters are under investigation. Um, there's a 55 violations that involve uh, US American lobster regulations and enforcement actions are pending. Um, next, I wanted to give a couple updates related to OLE's efforts on emerging technologies. Um, again, this is a, a, a repeat from the um, New England Council report a week ago, so I apologize for that. But first, efforts are underway to train NED staff in the use of our newly acquired ROV 
Um, in December, five EOs and uh, enforcement officers and one special agent participated in an ROV training provided by Ocean Botics to learn how to safely set up, operate, and maintain our ROV. ROV program efforts to date have focused on offshore inspection, largely in lobster management area three, utilizing a contracted platform vessel equipped with an ROV capable of reaching the depths found offshore and an operator skilled in the use of that ROV. NED's purchased ROV is smaller and while not suitable for deployment at the greater depths found offshore, it is capable of being deployed on smaller vessels such as NED's two patrol vessels and JEA vessels. Um, we plan to continue offshore ROV patrols. For those patrols, we use a contracted platform vessel, ROV and operators done previous, previously. Um, uh, the other item I wanted to mention related to emerging, te emerging technologies, OLE ordered a mobile radar video system to provide an additional data source for uh, North, North Atlantic right whale seasonal management area enforcement. Um, the intended use, use of this system is to acquire data from vessels that don't have an AIS signature. Delivery is set, set for this, uh, September 2022, and when the SMAs are not in effect, OLE intends to use the system at the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary in Great Lakes to protect historical resources there. Um, last, I wanted to mention that, uh, as always, NED is paying close attention to all the major current major regulatory shifts in uh, fisheries management. Um, and this is also a repeat from last week. A couple of the, the highlights are more um, New England focused. Um, we're uh, paying attention to the, the recent changes uh, implemented with the changes to the Atlantic large whale take reduction plan last fall, um, as well as implement, implementation of Amendment 23, in, in particular, the uh, electronic monitoring related regulatory requirements involved with that action. But uh, the uh, main point I wanted to highlight for this group is that all of NED has now been trained from staff by staff from GARFO's um, APSD um, on EVTR. Our agents and officers have a working understanding now of the hardware and software industry will be using to remain in compliance from a dockside and at sea boarding operation perspective and that's 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 all i have to report today mr chairman i'm available if anyone else has um further questions on the the second half of my report yeah thank you um let me see if anyone has questions any questions from the council any questions from the public Okay, I, I, Caleb, I don't see anything. So thanks for your report. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Look forward to uh, to see hopefully seeing you in a in a few months. I hope so. Yeah, let's hope so. Um, so the last report we have is the U.S. Coast Guard report. Um, Lieutenant Commander, are you with us? Just look. Hey, more, Mr. Chair. Yeah, go ahead. Is that, um, is okay, that good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah. Hey, this is uh, yeah, Matt Kay from uh, from Coast Guard and uh, yeah. Go Coast ahead. Street. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just I was scrolling through to make sure you were on the call here with us this morning. Um, yeah, we have Matt Kaylee uh, to give us the uh, Coast Guard report. Sure. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, good morning, everyone uh, from the Coast Guard. For the past uh, uh, two months, into December and January, uh, we conducted 110 boardings. Uh, the bulk of those were on uh, how the migratory species, Lennox bass, and uh, snapper grouper complex fisheries. Of those boardings, uh, we issued four uh, enforcement action reports. Uh, one was for a, uh, a striper that was uh, a wreck boat, had a striper that was in possession in the EEZ, um, and had another for uh, a commercial fishing vessel that uh, did not have a permit uh, for, the, for the species they were targeting. And then we issued uh, two, um, two enforcement action reports for uh, for vessels that did not have uh, operators permit operators permit on board. Uh, we are winding down our uh, operation uh, stars and stripers that are targeting the Atlantic striped bass as they're starting to migrate um, out of our um, area. For uh, for some of the cases uh, that we've had over the past two months for marine casualties, we've had two uh, related to uh, to pollution. Uh, one was in North Carolina. One was in New Jersey. Um, discharging fuel into the water. 
We had two uh, flooding cases, uh, both in North Carolina, and uh, we also had four grounding cases. Um, three of them were in North Carolina, um, another one was in Maryland, and then we had uh, two loss of propulsion uh, cases. One was in Virginia, um, another one was in North Carolina, and then uh, lastly, we had uh, three terminations uh, where we terminated the voyages of uh, of vessels that did not have the uh, proper safety gear uh, on board when we came on board to inspect them. Um, and that's that's kind of an overall uh, summary for uh, for the past two months. And uh, that's that's all I have for this report. Uh, subject to any questions? Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Um, let me see if anybody has any questions. Michelle Duvall, go ahead, Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Matt, for the report. I was just noting, um, you know, the the boarding statistics that you have right at the top of the report that y'all were really super super busy compared to, um, you know, 2021 numbers, and was that like almost double? You know, the total number of of boardings was that primarily due to sort of like easing of COVID restrictions or um, I was just curious about that. Sure. Yeah. No. Uh, thank you for, for uh, thank you for the question, Michelle. Um, that's largely what they're in response to um, is the is the COVID uh, concerns that we've had. Um, we also were supporting some different operations last year that um, they, they they tend to pull our resources away from time to time. So there's a little bit of that involved. So the, a couple of different variables, but I would say the the main bulk of the reason why the boardings are a lot higher this uh, this go around is largely because of the COVID. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Um, thanks for the question, Michelle. Any other questions for the Coast Guard? Right. I don't see any hands. Anyone from the public? All right. Seeing no hands from the public. Um, Matt, thanks for your presentation. And like I've said to others, uh, looking forward to hopefully seeing you in uh, in a couple months. But thank you very much. Likewise. Thanks, Mr. Chair. All right. So we're going to go, we're going to wrap up today with the liaison reports and start with New England. We've already talked um, a little bit about some of the things that might have been on uh, Peter Hughes and uh, Eric Reed's. Um, list for things that they wanted to bring up today but uh i'm going to turn to i'm going to turn to peter if that if you're okay with that eric and then we'll come to you um you know if there's anything you want to fill in great thank you mr chair good morning again everybody uh this is my liaison report from last week's new england fishery management council meeting uh held via webinar um First agenda item out of the gate was the skates and the skate report where the council updated one of the objectives for skates to read, quote, to promote and encourage skate research for critical biological, ecological, and fishery information based on the research needs identified and updated by the council, end quote. The council then submitted amendment six to NOAA fisheries, which includes these updates. Under the habitat report, there's a couple of items that I have. One of them we already discussed, um, which was the Great South Channel management area where uh, uh, Chris and staff were able to put the motion up on the board uh, that we were able to read. Uh, another discussion was uh, the possibility of a new uh, habitat area of a particular concern. Um, and the uh, council identified that the Southern New England with the following problem statement. A new HAPC in Southern New England is needed to provide conservation focus for specific New England Fishery Management Council managed species with essential fish habitat in the area. This is due to concerns about impacts from offshore development, specifically offshore wind in the near term and possibly offshore aquaculture uh, in the future. Um, and those were the two that that was one of the items and there was the clam uh oh and also in response to aquaculture the council tasked the staff to prepare a letter <laughs> regarding running tide aquaculture to address habitat and fishery concerns 
um, the executive committee is going to re review and approve that letter um, and then uh, send that out. Uh, under other business part one, that was the Hudson Canyon National Marine Sanctuary that we already discussed here today. Uh, we got a uh, scallop committee report. Uh, the council received the final report on the evaluation of area management and an update on a timeline for scoping on leasing. Uh, there's a live link to a press release in my liaison report if anybody wants to uh, to go a little more in depth on that. Uh, the council addressed and recommended to GARFO uh, 2022 recreational fishing measures. Um, that motion can be read in my uh, report that was distributed by Chris uh, this morning. Um, so please take a look at it uh, if you're interested. The council also took action to address the Atlantic Cod management areas. Uh, the motion reads that the ground fish committee consider whether priorities should be changed to develop a plan for transitioning from the current two cod management units to five revised management units. So they're moving forward with um, uh, defining five uh, areas of management for the cod stock. Uh, under other business part two, uh, the council approved a comment letter on the American Conservation and Stewardship Atlas, which is part of the America's the Beautiful Initiative under Executive Order 14008. And that, Mr. Chairman, concludes my liaison report. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, thanks for your report. Let me see if there's any questions, but I'll also ask um, the chairman of the uh, of the New England Council, Eric Reed, if you had anything else you wanted to add. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, I don't have anything to add to Peter's report, but I just wanted to commend Jason Didden. Uh, there were two macro public information sessions held uh, to accommodate requests from New England, uh, and Mr. Didden was above and beyond in his professionalism. And I really appreciated that. And anybody that happened to be listening in to at least the one on the 11th will certainly understand what I'm talking about. So thanks a lot, Jason. Yeah, thanks, Eric, and thanks, Jason. Um, are there any questions for Peter or Eric? Anyone from the public? All right, I don't see any hands coming up at this point. Um, Peter, thanks for the report and, and thanks for the, uh, Eric, thank you for the recognition uh, of our hardworking staff here at the council. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, so lastly, the last thing that we have today, uh, I'm gonna turn to the South Atlantic Council and Dewey Hemelwright. If there's a, do, Hello, we, do you have a report for there us is, today? There is no uh, South Atlantic Council report. Their meeting was in December and the next meeting is in March. So there'll be an April report. Thank you. Okay. And um, so I didn't acknowledge Carrie before um, representing the South Atlantic Council. I got a note from Michelle Duvall. Um, that carries with us. Was there anything that you wanted to bring up? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hope you can hear me okay. Um, yeah, yeah I've been the past, yeah. the past couple of days and have learned a lot and appreciated the um, deep dive into Robert's rules last night. That was fun. Um, I have a report prepared. It's also in your briefing book, so I will defer to you whether or not. Um, you want me to go through it, I can be brief or you can just refer to what's in the briefing book. It, it's really um, at your discretion, Mr. Chair. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Uh, if it's in the briefing book um, and the materials available, if there are any highlights or anything that you wanna identify, um, you know, Dewey, you know, at, at, as the representative for the mid, um, will he'll report out, um, 
you know, after your next meeting. But if there's anything you want to highlight for us, now's the time. Uh, no, in addition to, um, excuse the clerk, the dog has not barked in two days and now it's barking. Um, I just wanted to say in addition to our meeting in March, um, this Monday, we did have a short um, half day council meeting um, to discuss um, a uh, allocation decision tree that our staff is developing um, that we hope to use as a tool not necessarily, um, you know, sort of a tool that's going to give us a definitive answer, but a tool as we make our decisions, um, as we get new assessments where the former uh, coastal household tele telephone survey numbers have been converted to FES and we have to look at um, allocation again for each species. Um, and so our staff has worked really hard on developing this decision tree tool and and as a council, we're just at the point of giving them feedback and determining whether it would be a good tool for us. So that is a meeting that we had this Monday. Um, it was determined that staff would make some um, adjustments based on our meeting Monday and bring it back to us in March. Um, so that might be the only thing that is not in the report you all got. And I'm okay. also just happy to answer any questions if you have any. Yeah, any questions? For Carrie, and you know, I hope that. So yesterday, I hope you mentioned the uh, the Roberts rules and the crazy hecticness of dealing with yesterday's agenda. Um, that is not typical uh, of, <laughs> of the operation. So if if it's the first time you've listened into our to our calls, uh, it's not how things normally go. Um, <laughs> no, just, no, I'm things away. Get a little. We got a little squirrely yesterday, and uh, but thank you for being here, and I, um, I appreciate your report. I I don't see any hands for questions. All right, thank time. you all very so, much. I appreciate yeah, your time. Hopefully, we'll we'll have you back in uh, the next time. Yes, take care. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, that that wraps it up for liaison reports. Um, let me ask the council: Is there any uh, new or other business? To come before the council at this time. Adam. Great, thanks very much. And I certainly don't want to uh, uncover any old wounds here that are as most recent as 24 hours old. Um, I did want to make a request uh, that leadership have some discussion with staff uh, with regards to the harvest control rule and the timelines we saw. And I don't want to have a discussion given our commitment here to the ASMFC to do these all this work jointly. But I would just ask for some consideration uh, of is there a place for our summer flounder black sea bass and scup committee uh anywhere in the timeline that we had seen and i'm just asking again for leadership to have some discussion in the next couple of weeks month or so about is there a place for that committee uh, i bring that forward today uh based on what we saw transpire yesterday where there was clearly a difference of opinion for a period of time uh, between the council and the commission. Uh, and given that, I just want to make sure that the council's uh, concerns uh, are vetted uh, with what purse people's uh, rationale for the direction they were headed yesterday. Uh, so I would just ask for some consideration to be given about that discussion, would certainly encourage that discussion with ASMFC staff and as chair of that committee. Uh, you know, I'm happy to hear your thoughts. Again, that, that would just be a request for further discussion uh, collaboratively with all parties involved. Okay. Um, do you have any suggestions on, on how that would work? And I, I might ask Chris to, to jump in on this one as well. Well, I think the, the main thing I'm interested in is, is there a place given that we have identified, staff has identified the critical nature of the analysis part of the models for regulations in particular, uh, is there a place that the committee could help inform that process? 
Uh, is there a place where the committee could help review anything that the SSC comes forward with? Uh, given that we're not doing public comment the way the agenda is being done for the council and we're relying uh, on the framework meetings, uh, many frameworks this council has gone through in the past on other actions has involved committee work. Again, I recognize the unique nature of this. I'm not trying to circumvent any previously agreed to <laughs> joint efforts, um, but I think, uh, again, that there's uh, some opportunity here maybe for some additional discussion and that committee could help with that. Yeah. Okay, I appreciate that, Adam. Uh, let me ask Chris if if, um, if you want to chime in. Do you have any thoughts, Chris? Chris Moore, you're on mute. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm still having problems with my mic. There you go. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate the comments, Adam. Certainly, uh, after the meeting uh, this week, I'll sit down with uh, Julia. And talk to her about the uh, schedule. Uh, I think we had a good discussion yesterday about the schedule. I think we're on the on the same page with the uh, policy board now, and uh, certainly we could talk about how we might want to utilize the demersal committee in further conversations, discussions, decisions as we move forward with uh, that uh, particular action. Okay. Yeah, maybe you know after. After you have a chance to talk to Julia, Chris, maybe we can get on the phone and, and try to plan something out. It's good. And bring Adam in and, and uh, figure out where, where the committee can maybe play a role in this. Okay, was there, so let me ask any questions related to that uh, discussion and thanks Adam for bringing that up. Anyone else on the call? Uh, I don't see any hands, anyone from the public? I'll ask one last time, is there any new uh, or continuing business that we need to address at this point? Okay, seeing no hands at this time, I wanna thank everyone for your participation and your patience yesterday and getting through the, uh, the agenda that we had uh, set out for the last couple of days. Um, hopefully, we'll all be able to see each other. Hopefully, uh, in Jersey soon. And uh, I will call this meeting adjourned. Thank you all very much. Be safe right. and be careful. Take Thank care. you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.